Hey, everybody, it's Tab here. I'm speaking with Cassie today, and we're going to be talking about food and your relationship with it and how that ties into wounds. So if you feel like you're struggling with food, come on in and maybe you can learn something today. Welcome, everybody, to the CPTSD podcast. We are back with season four, episode six. Today, we're going to be talking about eating food and how childhood trauma can impact those experiences, and maybe most importantly, what to do about it. So I'll introduce you to Cassie in just a moment, but I want you to know this is most likely going to be a two-parter because there's so much to talk about. Am I right, Cassie? Um, Right. So I just wanted to start off and say that this information is important to me as somebody who has a lot of adverse childhood experiences that did indeed turn out to be traumatic and how that impacted my experience of food, my experience of myself with food, um, all of those things that we like to talk about in diet culture, which I hear you're single-handedly trying to annihilate, Cassie. So we'll get there. Um, But from my perspective, I grew up in a household where there was a lot of critiquing. Um, I was an extension of my narcissistic parent. And so my performance was always criticized. And also I had to appear perfect. And so I remember diets being part of my life forever. I don't remember not being told about my issue with food, (laughs) whatever that is. Um, including being on like the the Metafast Cambridge type diet when I was in the fourth grade. That stuff tastes like dirt. Um, and I was expected to enjoy it, right? But also when not only your weight or your size or the way you eat or what you prefer to eat, when that's all criticized, even your method of eating at the table, it also developed in me an issue where I didn't want to eat in front of anybody. Because I could have been told you're chewing your food like a cow, (laughs) lots of different things that could have come in there to hurt me. And so that made me really protective. And I'm really excited to be talking with Cassie today because already I've been to her website and looked up a couple of things. And the things that struck me right off the top, Cassie, and I'll introduce you again in just a second, was 10 ways to sleep better when you have serious food cravings. That was really, really helpful. And also you have a download about busting cravings and those cravings can be so big, so big, because sometimes it's about the actual food chemical that we want to get into our body, like a sugar hit, right? But sometimes it's also about the fact that in every culture that we know of, food equals love. And so whatever spawning those cravings, getting to the root of it might be helpful. So we're here today to speak with Cassie Christopher. She is a registered dietitian nutritionist, and she has a lot of experience and insight into how to shift our thinking and our experiencing of food and ourselves to a more healthful, accepting place. And so Cassie, could you just start us off with a little bit of information about you and why this is a passion for you? I would love to. I would love to. So I work predominantly with women who are struggling with emotional or binge eating and who have some form of trauma history. That's why I you know, sought you and, and your podcast out. Um, I myself have a CPTSD diagnosis, so I have a lot of empathy and understanding, and, and I'll share a little bit about my story in a moment. But um This passion comes from the recognition that we often blame ourselves for our food struggles. Mm. And we're so often told and it's reaffirmed that, you know, you didn't do that diet successfully and it's your fault. We never think to question like, well, maybe that diet is nonsense, right? Like that never comes up. It's always (laughs) our fault. So that my passion for this topic comes from not only my personal experience, but also from this uh, mission I have to not quite single-handedly, because there's a lot of other people doing this work, luckily, but to set people free from all of this shame around food. Um, you know, and that's what stuck out to me when you were talking about it, not feeling safe to eat in front of people. You know, we we have that shame and it isolates us. And so mm-hmm. um, for anyone listening, if you're 
struggling with food, you know, there's hope. I hope that's what people take from this conversation and some practical tools to start to release that shame. You mentioned on my website, a cravings busting audio guide, which you can get at cassiechristopher.net forward slash free. And just want to start by inviting everyone to get that free resource. Um, it's a great place to start. <clears throat> so my story with with food and understanding the role it played in my life happened when I was in grad school studying nutrition of all things. And there was this tension there where I was trying out these restrictive diets that I was learning about. This is very early on when keto was not a thing in, in popular culture yet. Um, and so, you know, it was trying to get rid of those carbs, right? Whatever it may be. And also I had so much stress and anxiety from my experience as a student having to get straight A's and, and really not knowing how to do, how to do, you know, A minus work. It was that perfectionism was, was playing a part. And so I would go from on this pendulum swing of trying to be this perfect student, perfect person, you know, perfect holistic nutrition practitioner and eat my kale and sardines, which I think sardines are so gross. If you love them, God bless you. Um, and then on the other end of things, you know, ending up in the school cafeteria, eating like three cupcakes in a sitting or every day at the convenience store or buying this artisanal dark chocolate um, from the Seattle area, Theo's, you know, shout out, so delicious, uh, to help comfort myself. Mm -hmm. And I was really eating, hindsight's 2020, right? To dissociate, to numb, to not feel the discomfort of the anxiety. And I felt really crappy <laughs> about it, for lack of a better word. I thought, what on earth is wrong with me that I cannot figure this out? And I'm supposed to go out in the world and help people eat better. And here I am, you know, eating dark chocolate and cupcakes and whole vats of guacamole, right? And so it in that time as well, I was carrying so much shame, you know, from, from this lack of perfection. Also, you know, I, I grew up in a high control religious environment and I had, again, hindsight's 2020, right? This nervous system dysregulation already from my adverse childhood childhood experiences. And I, I didn't even know about that at that time. And all of this coalesced into a severe panic attack. Mm. I woke up in the middle of the night and I was standing in the middle of my bedroom. So yes, I opened my eyes and I was standing with no memory of how I got there. And I was screaming at the top of my lungs. If you've ever heard a story about a subconscious crying for help, right there it was. And I, I felt like someone was trying to murder me, right? Like mm. that was feeling within my body. And so I knew something was wrong and how I dealt with it was I went to my school's, um, you know, therapy teaching clinic. Uh, and when I, when I say therapy, it was a naturopathic teaching clinic and they put me on lavender pills. So <laughs> <laughs> which of course did not solve the problem. All it did was give me burps that tasted like soap. And I, you know, white knuckled and tried harder to be okay. And so this went on for some time. I muddled on alternatively using food or restriction to escape the discomfort of my anxiety and not realizing that, you know, I wasn't able to feel good because I was mired in shame from all of this cultural wounding, all of this trauma that I believed I wasn't okay just as I was. So it was too painful to be myself. It was too painful to be in the present because the present was unsafe. And so as a result, I could not sustain any healthy change. I could not enact healthy boundaries that weren't either overly restrictive, right? Or, uh, or, you know, that pendulum swing just kept going back and forth. And I didn't know what I wanted or what my body needed because I believed that my body was bad. You know, I believed that it was fleshly to bring in that religious language that it was sinful. It shouldn't be listened to. And also it didn't feel safe. That was this, the, my body was where the panic was coming from. Right. Right. And so I was unable to take good care of myself as a result. And I was stuck in this place of using food in this way. 
that makes a lot of sense. And I thank you so much for sharing your story. And we might dig into more of that as we go by. Um, but I just wanted to comment on a couple of things. The first is total shout out to feeling like you're trying to help other people while you're still struggling with the same stuff. I can feel you on that one. Um, and it's really easy to go down into imposter syndrome when you when you have all of these things layered up. So I'm really glad that you figured out you wanted to keep going and you're ending up here with us today. The other thing is I spoke at the beginning about overt abuse, you know, criticism, canceling, but a lot of us with ACEs also had neglect, right? And that's when you think about abuse is like things that shouldn't have happened that did and neglect is things that should have happened that didn't. That neglect really set me up to not understand how to take care of myself. And so I would love to hear about, I don't know if that's your source, you know, but I would love to hear how you learn to take good care of yourself. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it came from my eyes being opened to the source of this shame that I was carrying. Mm -hmm. And I call this, um, our cultural wounding and it, it can come from so many places, you know, you mentioned diet culture at the beginning, certainly this idea that you have to be thin, small, white, toned, but not too toned, um, you know, with with Western European features uh, in order to be pleasing, that you have to be controlling what you eat and restricting what you eat in order to be someone who has self-control and discipline. And so when you you know, don't fit that mold, then you are shamed and you believe that you are not good enough, that you are not worthy of love and connection with other people or, or with yourself. For me, I saw it in hustle culture. So this idea that I need to be always producing, always productive, always going, right? That rest is not something I have access to or rest disqualifies me from uh, value and being, you know, my, my humanity essentially is based in work. Um, Self-improvement culture, you know, this is one that people are just starting to talk about, but this idea that we always have to be improving, you know, we always have to be healing. And what if, what if we're okay, just as we are? And yeah, things are difficult. Yeah, there, there's struggles, you know, we'll figure it out. And for me as well, I, I mentioned high control religion and this idea that my body was not good, that my desires were suspect at best and probably leading me down the slippery slope to hell, you know, at, at worst, that one was was really harmful. So if your body isn't good, then your body needs to be controlled. Your body is a shameful thing. And of course, we can layer purity culture on top of that, um, which is uh, something I experienced as well. And, mm -hmm. and then we have shame about sexuality and sensuality. Of course, you mentioned um, the ACEs. And I loved your episode on that episode um two of, of this season, season four, where you talked about the adverse childhood experiences and there's a high connection between uh, ACEs and eating disorders. So we can see, you know, that this is, is shown in the media. And then of course, our individual traumas, whether that be spiritual trauma, religious trauma, childhood trauma, whatever it may be, it can often leave us certainly wounded, but ashamed of who we are, ashamed of our body. And so we carry these things as wounds and we can't connect to our own desires for change because they're seen as suspect. They're seen as bad. We can't connect to our own inherent goodness as human beings. And, and so it's really difficult to get to a place where we accept who we are authentically, except even the struggles we're going through, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can't accept our struggles. We have to always be hustling. And, and you can see as I'm talking that that then creates um, this, this perfect place to be stuck in. 
And it takes overcoming that shame and caring for your body in a specific way so that you can take good care of yourself. And that was the journey I went on working with a therapist. I got diagnosed with CPTSD and I really felt freedom and understanding these influences that were happening to me. And then learning, like I said, about all the different cultural wounding going on around me and realizing how I'm being impacted that this hatred of myself was not coming from inside of me, was not who I am, that that was being spoken over me, my culture and the work I got to do and, and the work I continue to do, right, is to recognize that that's not me. That's not what I want for myself. I'm going to step into my goodness and take care of myself out of that place. Oh my goodness. I love that stepping into your goodness and, and taking care of yourself out of that place, because just a, a little commentary, all of the ways you're describing us feeling wounded and stuck because of our experiences in our families of origin or in our culture I just want to take a moment and point out that that is intended stuckness. Capitalism wants us to feel horrible about who we are and what we're doing so that we buy more stuff. And in families of um, origin or religions that are high control and the way you're talking about also that behavior that they exhibit is meant to oppress. And so figuring out that it's not you is step number one. And that's a really hard step. We're coming to the end of part one, as I thought we might. Um, do you have one tip that you would like to offer um, until we can get into the meat of how to really heal these wounds um, before we say goodbye today? Yes, yes. So um, Brene Brown, the person that I would most like to have lunch on with anyone on the planet, you know, that <laughs> standard icebreaker question. Um, has wonderful research uh, about shame. I'm, I'm sure your audience is familiar with her. And, and she says we need two things to heal shame, and that is empathy and self-compassion. Now, of course, when we're trying to work on healing our relationship with food and to ourselves, there's more we have to get to maybe add in there. And, and we'll talk about that in part two. But for now, for getting started, start with self-compassion. I always recommend that we when people are noticing these thoughts that are self-critical or whether they be internally or, you know, things other people say um, to put their hand on a comforting place on their body. For me, it's, it's on my, my chest, you know, two hands on my chest and take a deep breath and say to yourself, may I be kind. Hmm. May I be kind. And if that language doesn't resonate with you, I've got clients who say I deserve to be kind. I've got clients who say I love myself no matter what. Um, may I be kind resonates with me. Pick what resonates with you and re remind yourself to be kind. And here's what I want everyone to know about this, because we try, often try things once and think, well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> to the next thing. But we actually are rewiring our brains when we do this. And it takes doing it again and again and again. And what I promise people listening out there is the more that you notice those critical thoughts happening and the more you practice, may I be kind, you will rewire your brain um, to, to have kindness as an option um, and that you can choose for yourself more often. And so it, it gets easier over time and you can, you can try it once, try it on and then try it again and again. And um, you'll, you'll begin to heal with such a simple phrase. And a beautiful phrase. And I, I really appreciate that you're saying this is a muscle that we're building. Right. And so it will take practice to come with that. And I love that tuning in and touching that place that feels good on your body to do that. It's really beautiful. I'm going to offer a follow up tip after you've done what Cassie has just recommended and you feel stable, right? You're okay. Mm -hmm. Take a moment and an easy breath. We don't want those shoulders moving up, just tummy breath and ask yourself, whose voice was that? because I'm almost willing to bet money it wasn't actually yours. So Cassie, thank you for being here for part one. We're going to deep dive into action steps or into other ideas in our next um, episode. 
until then, everybody head over to Cassie's website, see if there's some resources there that can help you. If you would like to hear my thoughts about this in a spiritual sense, you can go subscribe to the Karmic Alchemy community at TabithaBirdWeaver.com. Come join us for a little bit deeper conversation. And uh, we'll see you next episode. Bye, everybody. <music>